Houston. We are honored to showcase a passionate international educator, CELTA, Certified English Instructor, Assessment Specialist, Business Course Coordinator, Teacher Trainer, and a former Foundation Stage Headmistress. She always tries to do her best to present her students an unforgettable experience that would make them enjoy what they learn and strive to know more. Her session title is Project Based Learning. She is Noha Abukaram, representing Egypt. Hi, Noha. Uh, no, you're on mute. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Stay okay. easy. Uh, thank you. Noha. Yeah. Thank you so much. And I'd like before we start to thank Matilda for her amazing presentation. Uh, very in enlightening. Thank you so much. And I'd like to thank you for your nice, um, you know, uh, introduction to all the speakers. You have a very unique way to present the speakers. Uh, thank you, Anusha, and I'd like to thank Gavin also and you again for the initiative. Uh, I can see where this is going. It's going to be something big in the future. Thank you so much for giving us this chance. Thanks to the amazing educators you hosted uh, through this global conference. And uh, thanks to all the attendees. Uh, it's really amazing and nice to have you all uh, with us in this uh, conference. Um, I'd like to start first by introducing myself. So uh, my name is Noha Abu Karam, and uh, as Anusha said, I'm the head uh, of the testing unit in the English Language Center in Faros uh, University in Alexandria. I'm from Egypt. Um, it's 9.30 a.m., <laughs> so I've just uh, had my breakfast. Um, I'm also a teacher trainer, uh, as a, a National Geographic Certified Educator, and above all, a CELTA Certified English Teacher. Uh, I've been working in the educational field since my graduation in 2002. Uh, since then, I've been working with different age groups within different educational contexts here in Egypt and overseas as well. So, yeah, it was a long journey with uh, lots of, you know, ups and downs, <laughs> uh, but a very, very rich one. Um, today, I'm going to um, talk to you about uh, project-based learning. Uh, before I start talking about project-based learning, I'd like to say that I'm a very um, big advocate to outdoor classrooms, to promoting critical thinking skills, uh, raising cultural awareness inside the EFL classrooms, and of course, to applying project-based learning without, within our teaching contexts. Um, let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? Okay, great. So, when it comes uh, when it comes to project-based learning, as you uh, many of you may know, it's a new trend in education, really. Um, so, yeah, it's a new trend. And if you go to the internet searching for uh, a definite definition to project-based learning, uh, you won't find any. I did my job, you know, I searched a lot and I ended up with uh, many descriptions, but not a definite definition. So it seems that still we have scholars and educators looking at it, you know. Um, it's easy to go and read about the theories and, you know, read articles about the theoretical part. But it's really hard to find an action plan to follow. So the question here for teachers and the real challenge is where to start. What should I do? What are the steps I should follow to apply or go for project-based learning in my teaching context with my students? And I was lucky enough to uh, go through a course with National Geographic where I found that they apply project-based learning with the students. So today I'm gonna walk you through 
uh, the, an action plan that you can use if you want to go for project-based learning with your students. It's an amazing trend and approach to use inside your classrooms, and you're going to discover with me why. And at the same time, I'm going to hit quickly on the uh, theoretical part in case some of us uh, are not familiar with the project-based learning and they need to know what is it. Okay. So as I said, I'm going to start with the, the theoretical part first and start with the Thomas Markham description. He said, project-based learning integrates knowing and doing. Students not only learn knowledge and elements of the core curriculum, but also apply what they know to solve authentic problems and produce results that matter. And authentic here is a key word when it comes to project-based learning. And we're going to see how. Buck Institute for Education describes project-based learning as a teaching method in which students gain knowledge and skills by working for an extended period of time to investigate and respond to an authentic, engaging, and complex question, problem, or challenge. And as you can see, the word authentic here is repeated again. So my focus today is uh, on the National Geographic Learning Framework and principles in applying project-based learning. What we're going to do now is we're going to watch a video of uh, uh, to one of the certified National Geographic educators. She's going to talk in this video uh, about how she applied project-based learning with her students. I want you to relate and to reflect uh, on this video while watching this video, relate to the two descriptions we've just read and see what did she achieve and how did she apply and uh, these two descriptions. So this is where I am now. Can you listen? Can you hear the video? Okay, yeah. okay. My husband and I have become monarch farmers. We're helping the monarchs, and it's all because of National Geographic and a wonderful class of curious students. Hi, I'm Jan Albert. Um, I'm a fourth grade teacher at Harrison Elementary in Janesville, Wisconsin. I started this journey in March with my 26 students. We needed a project. We wanted something that we could do to make a difference in the world, and my kids needed something hands on. When one of the students mentioned that monarch butterflies are declining and that they have a habitat in their backyard, we were hooked. So we started by listing what we knew about monarch butterflies. We found out we really didn't know very much at all about monarchs. And so we turned to the National Geographic Monarch Butterfly Life Cycle and Migration Lesson Plan. It's really, really well done. And the note-taking sheet that goes along with it worked well for all of my students because it asked for words and illustrations. Now that we knew a little bit about monarchs anyway, we wanted to find out more about their migration. My students' curiosity was really sparked by all of this, and they were so excited to look into things more. So I found a list of butterfly sanctuaries in the United States and in Mexico. S students worked on their research with a partner, made it easier for them to share ideas and discuss their findings. They were so engaged. It was amazing to watch. For me, this was one of the first times in my teaching career that I'd actually tried to connect with the larger world. I had an idea. I was excited. We were going to Skype. Never done it before. I know we can do it. We weren't quite ready yet. We needed to visualize how amazingly long these migratory routes of the monarch really are. And so we used National Geographic's Map Maker Interactive and I printed out large pieces of a United States map and had my kids put it together. They were amazed at how much area the migratory routes covered from all the way from Mexico 
perhaps into the southern parts of Canada and all throughout the United States. My students were completely responsible for putting together the map, for hanging it up and mapping their routes. I loved the tie-in with the map skills with our social studies and our science. It was a perfect combination. And because I have so many kinesthetic learners in my classroom, they enjoyed this project tremendously. You might be able to tell from these last few pictures that it was hat day on the day we did the maps. As students continued to map their routes, they began to visualize more clearly that monarchs are more than just a little orange butterfly that you see in your backyard in the summer. As my students continued to collaborate on making this map and planning their routes, they also realized that this maybe was a bigger project than we had thought it might be to begin with. We could do more. And so they felt empowered to maybe make a difference in the world for the declining population of monarchs. We decided we were going to make a monarch habitat and that we were going to learn all we could to make a good habitat. Before that started though, I like to integrate other subjects in everything we do. And so we did a little bit of math to figure out the area, perimeter and volume of our garden. Students loved it. As a class, we made a list of questions that we wanted to ask Aslan Keys from the University of Minnesota Monarch Lab. This was our first Skype. I was nervous, I was excited, it was wonderful. So I stepped out of my box even further, and this time I was able to connect with Dr. Pablo Jaramillo from the Monarch Butterfly Biosphere Reserve in Michoacan, Mexico. He was engaging, he was helpful, the kids loved talking to him, and he answered every one of our questions. When we went back to what we thought we knew about monarch butterflies, we found out some of it was wrong, much of it was right, but we knew so much more. So now the biggest project of all, we were ready. How were we going to help the natural world? We're gonna build a monarch garden. And every child in our classroom was going to have a part in doing it. They collaborated with each other every time we came to a hurdle. I loved to see how well these kids worked together to achieve this goal. With every step, our garden continued to grow. We worked with a conservation group in our area to help get the plants for the garden. Did you know that if you put seven layers of newspaper underneath a raised garden before you put the dirt in, it will keep the weeds out for a long time? Amazing what you can learn from others. And four months later, our garden continues to bloom. The pollinators are already showing up. I can't wait till we see the first monarch. So now you see, this is our first monarch that we hatched at our house. The project is already carried beyond the classroom, into my home and into the home of other students who have said they can't wait to try this on their own. Full circle. Thanks, National Geographic. I've grown so much. Okay, so if we go back to Buck Institute for Education Description, we'll just find out that Janet did exactly what's there. She used a teaching uh, method in which her students gained knowledge and skills by working for an extended period of time to investigate and respond to an authentic, engaging, and complex question, problem, or a challenge. And again, authentic here is a key word that everything is going around. So where to start? Uh, first thing you need to think about, and this is something she talked about, is how to draw a connection between the natural world and the human world. So this is your starting point. So the three elements that the National Geographic Learning focuses on is the natural world, the human world, and the connection between the two. Then we have what we call perspectives and skills, and this is step two. So you have to think of which perspectives you want to tackle your topic according to and which skills you want to cover. You're free to use one perspective or more 
and you're free to use one to cover one scale or more. So as you can see, you have here seven perspectives, starting from spatial, cultural, economic, ecological, and going on. And we have three scales, the local, regional, global one. So I can cover in my project, the three scales. I can choose to go global with the topic, then get down to the regional scale, then get down to the local scale or vice versa. And I can choose to discuss the topic according to the cultural perspective and the spatial one, or take it to the seven perspectives. So this is step number two. Then you have to ask yourself what attitudes, skills, knowledge, I want my students to gain through this journey, okay? And this is sometimes we use this abbreviation, ASK, to talk about attitude, skills, and knowledge. And uh, under this topic, the National Geographic presents a ready-made learning framework for teachers to go read, pick and choose ready-made statements for their students for all grades. So as you can see here, um, under, let me just uh, move something, yes. Under attitudes, we have curiosity, responsibility, and empowerment for all grades. So for example, if you're a teacher teaching pre-K and you want to adopt the attitude of, of curiosity, you can pick the first statement, uh, which is children display enthusiasm for learning about themselves, others around them and their environment. If you want to uh, adopt the attitude of empowerment and you're teaching the first grade, for example, you can, for example, choose the second statement. Children try out different identities and play act roles. If you're teaching third grade and you want to adopt the uh, attitude of uh, responsibility, you can go, for example, for the first statement again or the last one. Children identify situations or circumstances that harm the environment. You can go for all of them, you know, for curiosity, responsibility, empowerment, and you can go also for multiple statements. That's fine. If we move on, as you can see, we have all grades up to the 12th grade. When it comes to skills, same applies. So you have here under skills, observation, communication, collaboration, problem solving. And also you have ready-made statements to pick and choose from for all grades. So for example, if you're teach, teaching fifth grade and you want to, for example, uh, adopt the skill of collaboration, you can pick the first statement, children work in teams to solve problems. If you want to go for communication for your eighth grade, you can choose, for example, the last statement, youth select and use appropriate technologies, uh, uh, maps, and other visual media to communicate their message. So uh, they made it easy for teachers, really. When it comes to knowledge, we have uh, three themes under knowledge. The human journey, our changing planet, and wildlife and wild places. And likewise, you'll find ready-made statements that you can go and pick and choose for uh, all grades. If we go to Janet's uh, lesson plan, you can see that uh, she said that the time she needed to execute um, uh, this uh, project with her students was from six to seven, 45 to 60 minute classes. 
And when she uh, talked about the attitudes, knowledge, skills, under attitudes, and you can see I highlighted what she wrote in yellow. She said, one of the attitudes this connects to is curious and adventurous. It also connects to the attitude of responsibility, being concerned for the welfare of others. My favorite attitude is that of empowerment. My students feel empowered with the knowledge they gained and the connections they made to make a difference in the world around them. When it comes to knowledge, she said, my students learn about the amazing migration of monarchs and how important they are as pollinators. They were amazed to know that living things cannot survive without pollinators and to see that link between humans and the natural world. Uh, when it comes to skills, she said skills included collaboration to achieve goals and solve problems, especially as we extend this learning to create our pollinator garden. So as you can see, she didn't use the ready-made statements. She uh, rephrased the statements and she created her own statement. So that's fine. You don't have actually the National Geographic Learning uh, framework to uh, have uh, statements. You can create your own. But it's uh, really nice to, you know, follow titles like this to make it easier for you. Okay, so that was uh, an execution to project-based learning through face-to-face -face teaching context. But now I want to ask you a question. After, you know, reading the descriptions with me and after watching Janet's execution, can we apply project-based learning in a virtual context over an extended period of time. What do you think? Can you write yes or no in the chat box? Okay, so I can see that uh, lots of yeses are coming. Okay, actually, yes, we can. And I'm going to show you another video to another uh, certified National Geographic educator who will talk about her uh, execution to project-based learning with her students. What if you could shape your community's future? My remote learners explored that idea by creating a plan for our town's land. My name is Rhonda Hankins. I'm currently a second and third grade remote teacher at Oak Borough Choice STEM School. Our school is dedicated to fostering creativity, responsibility, and collaboration on a regular basis through STEM activities. One of the great tools we use in our lesson planning is the use of project-based learning. When I first sat down to plan our next Social Studies and Science PBL, my vision for this project was to allow students the opportunity to collaborate and create their own vision for something that could impact the local community. I also needed something that could span two or more grade levels and was still standards aligned. This project turned out to be one of the best ones of the whole year. Students collaborated in groups in order to problem solve this project-based learning topic. A generous donor has donated 200 acres of land to the city. The city planner has asked teams of students to come up with a plan for how the land should be used. After introducing the topic, Students brainstormed what we know and what we need to know about this project. Their final ideas were added and posted on Canvas for students to refer back to. To launch the project, we also took a look at the National Geographic Map examples and the National Geographic Map Maker. 
They spent some time independently researching the different habitats that were on the land on a shared document. Then students broke out into teams to start working. The goal of this project was to get students to collaborate with peers in order to explore how the human and natural world interact on a local and regional scale. It was awesome to create such a great project that allows students to explore endless possibilities. Students looked at this problem through many different lenses or perspectives. They curiously explored the economic and geological effects that their decisions may have on the local community as well as the region around them. They were curious about how to protect the land while also providing entertainment and activities for people in the area. Here are some examples of the ideas students explored. A nature center, national parks are protected land, hiking trails, farming land, farmers markets to sell crops, housing and roads, and boating and docks. Our big focus was map it. Students had to not only create and plan their idea, but be able to translate that idea onto a map with a map key or legend. Then they had to justify their reasoning by writing a research-based letter to the local city planner. The challenge for this project was to allow students enough time to work together in groups, since this is a group of remote learners. Thankfully, using Google Meet breakout rooms ended up being the best tool we could use. Students met several times a week for two to three weeks in their breakout rooms to discuss ideas, and I was there to facilitate and help answer questions as needed. When it was all said and done, students were blessed to hear from an amazing local city planner and were able to present their final ideas to gain feedback and reflect. Our guest speaker gave some amazing feedback. I was so pleased to hear how my students considered so many of the factors that a city planner also thinks about, about on a daily basis. And once a person says something about fees, that's very important because everything I make a joke, but I tell everything costs so much. I, I've lived in Locust all my life, and I, I've, I've seen Locust change over the years. When I grew up here, we had one grocery store, we had, we had one place to eat, we had one stoplight. So I wanted to try to shape, have a hand in shaping the city, what it was going to be like in the future. Uh, and, and with me and a lot of other folks, I think we've done a pretty good job because more and more people are moving out this way from Charlotte and they want a lot of the things that they had while they was in Charlotte. You know, a lot of the amenities and the shopping and things like that. So it's very important that you plan out um, what your city's going to look like in the future. And I care about, I care about Locust and I care about Stanley County and what it's going to look like. And, what it's going to be in the future when I'm gone for the next person to take care of. Students overall had fun completing the project and rated their experience highly on the reflection form. As the teacher, I've been inspired to continue projects such as these so that they can showcase relevant local jobs that students may potentially have an interest in someday. Part of STEM is relating these projects and experiences to the real world and what better way to do this than to allow students to actually take on these jobs in a project. Then, when students are able to hear from someone who does this job for a living, they may be even more inspired to pursue job opportunities such as these someday. These real world connections really are a great way to get scholars inspired and excited and even more curious about the world around them. What if you could shape? Okay. So if we go uh, to Rhonda's lesson plan, we'll find that her time uh, for execution was uh, from three to four weeks. And when she started talking about uh, the skills and perspectives and the human and natural world connection, she said students will investigate the connections between the human and natural world through this unit. 
students research regional habitats and animals in order to plan the best use of the land for both people and animals. A better use for the land would be a nature center that houses only local animals. This unit allows students to explore ideas such as these and incorporate local and regional skills. So here she talked about the connection between the human and natural world, which is step one. And then she get down to talk about the skills she covered, the local and regional skills. And then she moved on to the perspectives. So she started talking about the economic and the geographic perspectives. She said, also explored in this unit are many different perspectives, perspectives of learning, namely the economic and geographic perspectives. Students explore how their choices could potentially affect the local economy and brainstorm solutions to help cover costs. And then she gave an example, and then she moved to the uh, geographic perspective, saying that students explore the different habitats and determine the best location for their buildings. Then she moved to the learning framework connections. She said that the attitude she adopted was the attitude of curiosity. Uh, she chose the skill of collaboration, and the knowledge area for her was, and for her students, where uh, was the wildlife and wild places. So if we go back to the theoretical part and uh, read what Blumenfeld uh, uh, said and elaborates on the process of uh, uh, project-based learning, we'll find that he said, Within this framework, students pursue solutions to non-trivial problems by asking and refining questions, debating ideas, making predictions, designing plans and or experiments, collecting, analyzing data, drawing conclusions, communicating their ideas and findings to others, asking new questions and creating artifacts. According to William here, uh, Kilpatrick, the teacher's role in this kind of learning should be of a guide as opposed to an authoritarian figure. So if we sum up the whole process, we'll find that for students, things starts with challenging problem or question, then sustained inquiry. Authenticity is a key word here. Student voice and choice is the thing that determine which direction we're gonna go. Reflection and critique and revision, and then we have a public product. So our product is gonna be uh, presented to public authentic audience at the end. Okay, what teachers should do? Actually, teachers, starts by designing and plan, then they align to standards, build the culture, manage activities, scaffold student learning, assess student learning, and then engage and coach. So as you can see, she's not uh, an authoritarian figure. She's just, you know, a guide to her student. Okay, now let's get down to another question. Can we apply project-based learning with our student in one session? What do you think? Yes or no? Can you write in the chat box, please? Okay, yes or no? What do you think?
Okay, so I can see many yeses again, and some people are, have concerns about the time. Okay, so for me, that was my personal challenge, you know, to, to be certified and get my certification. So I tried to apply project-based learning in one session with my students, and I'm going to show you how. And actually, I chose to go for the virtual uh, teaching context. So um, my students were sixth grade students, and the time I needed for execution was one hour. And I'm, I'm going to show you what did we do. So the first thing I asked my students to do is to uh, practice a matching exercise, you know, to make sure that they have an idea of what we're going to discuss and tackle in this session, you know. So as you can see, I asked them to match the pictures with these words. Then I asked them to run to the nearest rubbish bin. So take a look and I asked them, what can you see the most? And of course, the word plastic popped up. And that's what I wanted because the lesson was about the reality of plastic. Then I give them some, you know, difficult vocabulary that might stop their understanding when watching a documentary, a National Geographic documentary about the reality of plastic. Then I give them some just questions to uh, answer after watching the video. They watched, they answered. I give them another set of questions to answer after watching the video for the second time. They watched, they answered. And then I picked a piece of information that was presented in the video that said that Americans threw 100 million plastic bags every year. I asked them to go to the internet and find me an answer to this question. How many plastic bags do Egyptian people throw every year? And you can see that we have this shocking number. It's 12 billion plastic bags. So it was shocking for them, you know. So uh, what happened here is that I moved from the global scale to the local scale. Then I asked them to reflect on what they learned and what they know so far. Okay, so they started to circle the emoji, okay, that reflects their feeling and emotions. Then it was time to take an action. But before this, I asked them to go to the internet and search, do their search and discuss and come up with ideas to change what's inside our rubbish bin and how, uh, what can we do to reduce the use of plastic. So they came back with ideas. One of them was this uh, artwork, as you can see, it's recycled from buttons mostly. And then it was time to take an action. So we used the hashtag engineering for good. This hashtag was presented at the end of the video we watched. So my students used this hashtag they took it and they went to the social media platforms and they started to post their ideas to public audience using this hashtag. So as you can see, Jana, for example, she wrote, use paper bag instead of plastic bag, hashtag engineering for good. And we have here some people who started right away to interact with her. If we go to my lesson plan, reality of plastic, the opportunities for deeper human natural world connection was through showing them a video about the negative effect of plastic on the environment. 
This video highlighted the negative effect of the human's daily use of plastic on the environment, and the case was very, was very clear. When it comes to perspectives and scales, uh, I chose the cultural and ecological one. So under the cultural one, I said as Egyptians, and you can of course choose any other nationality, uh, we will discover what's inside the Egyptian rubbish bin. Number two, we will acknowledge how our rubbish bin is a reflection of our culture as consumers in comparison to another culture. When it comes to the ecological perspective, I said we will discuss the effect of plastic on our environment. We will get to know how plastic affect the environment worldwide. We will come up with solutions to be more eco-friendly. When it comes to scales, I chose the local and global one. Under the local one, we took a close look at the Egyptian daily practice and how it's related to the topic. And when it comes to the global scale, we learned about how the use of plastic affect the whole world and try to contact the people to empower them with our solutions globally. When it comes to the attitude, skills, knowledge, or what we call ask, I chose the uh, attitude of responsibility and I could, could go for more. I could have chosen, for example, empowerment as well. Uh, because they were empowered to, you know, take an action at the end. So uh, I chose this time for me to pick ready-made statements from the uh, learning, National Geographic Learning Framework. So I said, I picked youth are developing complex ways of thinking that allow them to understand and analyze the broader scope of human wants and needs beyond their immediate surroundings to the broader world. Under skills, I chose communication and I picked youth select and use appropriate technologies, maps, and other visual media to communicate their message. Under knowledge, I chose our changing planet and I picked youth understand that human activities impact Earth's living things in a variety of ways. So remember to think of the following points when planning project based learning or an activity, actually, you can apply these to an activity and still it's, you know, uh, considered uh, project-based learning. Number one, how are you going to draw a connection between the human world and the natural world? Number two, what perspectives are you going to address? Number three, what skills are you going to cover? Number four, what are the attitudes they are going to grow? What are the skills your students are going to practice? Number six, what knowledge your students are going to gain? Of course, the uh, National Geographic Learning website is full of heaps and heaps of resources, maps, videos to all grades, for all subjects. So I invite you all to go and visit this website. You'll find, uh, you know, heaps of resources there that you can rely on and they are free. Um, now let's uh, answer a question that I have from many teachers all the time. Then what's the difference between a project, doing a project and project-based learning? And this is a very good question I always get. As you can see, there is a big difference between the two. So when it comes to projects, a project can be done alone, but, but in project-based learning, uh, it requires collaboration and teacher's guidance. A project, is about the product, but when it comes to project-based learning, it's about the process itself. The project is teacher-directed, but project-based learning is student-directed, so we never know what we're gonna end with. Uh, when it comes to projects, all projects have the same goal, but for project-based learning, students make choices that determine the outcome, when it comes to projects, the products are submitted to the teacher. 
when it comes to project-based learning, the products are presented to authentic audience, to the real world. When it comes to projects, it's lack real world relevance. But when it comes to project-based learning, it's based in real world experiences or problems. And uh, I think someone asked in the chat box about non-trivial. Uh, issues. That's what we mean by non-trivial issues. It's authentic. It's real world experiences or problems. And when it comes to projects, it occur after the real learning. But when it comes to project-based learning, it's, uh, it's about, uh, uh, sorry, real learning occurs during the process. If you need more and you want to be a certified National Geographic educator one day, like myself and many others, like Janet and Rhonda, uh, I really highly recommend you go and check regularly the uh, learn, uh, the National Geographic Learning website, the professional development uh, section. They uh, open and they offer courses from time to time. They are free courses for teachers and they are amazing courses you, you won't regret. So that uh, actually these findings and all these resources were taken from the course of educator certification. It's not available right now in the, their website, but maybe, uh, you know, it will be offered again. So you need to check from time to time. Thank you so much. If you want me to provide you with the National Geographic Learning Framework or, or the presentation or anything, this is my email and this is my name on LinkedIn uh, because I don't think that you want, you may find the perspectives and skills on Google, it's there, uh, but you won't find the, you know, all the learning framework there. You, you find bits and pieces of it. Thank you so much. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer, answer them. Thank you so much, Noha. Thank you so much. You just yeah. finished on time. That was That's amazing. Thank you for your amazing session. Thank you for introducing us you know, to the project-based learning in terms of theory and practice. And we have love Thank pouring you. in all over the world for you. Cheryl Shaha writes, Thank you for this information on National Geographic. We'll surely check this out. Then we have Risti Kurniawati sharing the students as a center of the students learning. Then we have Neelam saying it will be a very limited topic if done on one session. It's true. And then we have people agreeing with your session. And if you have any more questions, I think you've already answered Jyoti Gupta's question. But if you have any more questions, uh, Akiri Khan from Nigeria says, Akiri Akron from Nigeria says, amazing how children collaborate to apply their knowledge and skills in shaping their community. We have one extra message. I just had a notification. Akiri, Khan, Akiri Akron again says, thank you so much, Noha. This was an insightful session. You successfully demystified and clarified what PBL really is. It is applicable. And we have Sweta Haria it saying, is. in case of limited time in classroom and in such a in, so, in rush of completion of the syllabus, how can project-based learning be used? So she's questioning. Actually, okay. So uh, as I told you, you know, it can be done uh, from my point of view and, you know, uh, from what I saw and experienced it myself, it could be applied within any time frame. It could be applied within one activity. But you have to make sure that you cover uh, step one, which is, to draw a connection between the natural uh, world and the human world, uh, you have to make sure to cover within this activity, you know, one or more scale and uh, one or more perspective. You have to make sure that the students are gaining knowledge, skills, attitude uh, through this activity. And this is not actually, uh, you know, uh, very difficult to do. Uh, and at the end, of course, the, uh, you know, uh, last, a product has to be presented or posted uh, somewhere. So I find it easy. The easiest way to do this is to force students to use their mobile phones, you know, uh, or talk to their families and friends about it. So um, I don't have uh, 
actually a problem at all in applying this trend of learning in any context. Thank you. Thank you so much, Noha. We have Deepika Khandelwal saying, Noha, have you collaborated PBL across disciplines to cover different topics across curriculum? Uh, actually, my teaching context, uh, you know, is different. Okay, so I haven't tried that much, but I have tried it online uh, with the sixth grade students during my certification. And during this certification, I've been exposed to other teachers. So uh, it was also a good thing to review other teachers' work, you know, and to evaluate their work, which is a very thing uh, to do during this course. So you're not only working uh, on applying this you know, to show that you understood what is it about, but you're also reviewing many of other teachers' work and you're starting to give them evaluation. This is part of your evaluation. Thank you. I hope that I answered the question. I hope she answered your question, Deepika. If you have any more, if you have any more queries, please do unmute yourself um, and discuss and know how we'll answer for you. Thank you so much, Deepika. Thank you so much, Noha. And we have Lauren saying, I love PBL and I'm so excited to learn more about Net Geo Education. Thank you so much. Thank you for imparting your knowledge. These truly are exciting times. So much love from sunny South Africa. Wow. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Anita Singh You're writes, welcome. sorry, Anita Singh writes, integrated learning projects are good to implement multidisciplinary project, projects-based learning. And Akhili Ikra again says, I have observed as well that it is not limiting. So where do, where do we not, uh, where we do not even have computers or gadgets because of our peculiarities of being under underfunded and children from vulnerable backgrounds, including disabilities, we can still learn focusing on their attitudes, skills, and knowledge. Exactly, exactly. I want to tell you that it works better in natural uh, atmosphere. And I, as I told you, I'm a, I'm a big advocate to outdoor classrooms. I don't like children sitting uh, in front of uh, gadgets, uh, you know, uh, between four walls. Uh, so, yes, uh, if we recall uh, uh, Janet's uh, project-based learning with her students, we'll find that most of it was outside. You know, they ended up uh, building uh, uh, something for the pollinators. Okay, so yeah, take them to the out world, you know, let them test the water, let's let them see the trees, let's let them what uh, they can do with this piece of uh, land. They can even, you know, plant a flower. This is project based learning, you know. So yeah, it's it needs a little bit of creativity Thank from you. the teacher. That's Thank all. You. Thank you so much, Noha. Thank you very, very much. Um, do uh, we have uh Kiri Akran again sharing oh, I think I've already I've already shared that with you all Jyoti Gupta says thank you in fact it works better without gadgets for research skills only exactly yes thank you Jyoti Gupta and I do have another I do have one question for you Noha if I may yeah sure thank you of course PBL is effective like you've mentioned achieving learners improving skills uh, you know, critical thinking skills communications collaboration creativity and uh, you know innovation um, however it has many challenges in my opinion like parents learners teachers and a group of learners may have uh, may often have disputes or contradictory interests and may have scarcity of resources so how would you like to you know um, accommodate these issues? As I told you, uh, I believe that uh, the teacher can overcome uh, these problems if uh, she is willing to be creative without, within her teaching context. She needs to understand the context and she needs to, uh, you know, to understand what she can go for and take and, you know, uh, for how long for how far, you know, uh, but I don't believe that uh, there is something that's unachievable. I don't believe in this personally, you know, so um, if you want to do it, you can do it. So I want to tell you that in my teaching context with, with here in Egypt, 
uh, with my university students, it's not familiar to take the children outside the classroom, classrooms, okay, or the lecture halls. Still, I take my students, you know, to the cafeterias in the campus and we take our lesson there. I take my students to the uh, green areas and we sit there, you know, which is weird for all the people here. So um, it's a new trend. It's uh, still uh, something that people are experiencing and talking about, okay? But uh, we're gonna see what will come, you know, over the years regarding uh, this uh, new trend. Thank you. Thank you so much, Noha. Yeah. Thank you so much for answering all the questions. Thank you so much, participants. And Teresa yeah. Boki from Indonesia writes, thank you. This is very helpful presentation. What do you think the best time using PBL in the learning? Because I think it takes more time for students. Actually, it depends on your teaching context. So as you can see, some teachers would use the whole semester to execute or, uh, you know, apply project-based learning with their students. Uh, uh, a teacher, uh, for example, who's teaching geography or history or language can go for it, you know. Uh, another home teacher can go for it and integrate all the subjects like Janet. She integrates many subjects within her project-based learning. So it depends in the context. It depends on the students. I uh, uh, was certified for one hour you know, lesson uh, using project-based learning. So, you know, uh, the sky is our limit when it comes to this uh, topic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nina. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you, everybody, for sharing your queries. Thank you, Noha, for answering and your yeah. amazing presentation. And TR Salini, yes. teacher Salini also writes, thank you so much for an informative session. Likewise, thank you very, very much. And thank you for participating in Education and Global Conference. Thank you, Noha. You're welcome. My pleasure. Okay. Thank you.